Chapter 7 The Way of Life and Customs of the Natives To describe the native life in all its outward monotony would seem to be both very easy and very readily attainable. Yet it is very difficult at the same time. As with every different way of life, one has to describe the round of living from one morning until the next, from one winter to the next, from birth, arrival in one's first camp, until death, death and simultaneously describe everything about all the many islands and islets that exist. No one is capable of encompassing all this, of course, and it would merely be a bore to read whole volumes. And the life of the natives consists of work, 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 of starvation, cold, and cunning. This work, for those who are unable to push others out of the way and set themselves up in a soft spot, is that self-same general work which raises socialism up out of the earth, and drives us down into the earth. One cannot enumerate nor cover all the different aspects of this work, nor wrap your tongue about them. To push a wheelbarrow. Oh, the machine of the OSO, two handles and one wheel, so. To carry hand barrows, to unload bricks bare-handed. The skin quickly wears off the fingers. To haul bricks on one's own body by goat in a shoulder barrow to break up stone and coal and quarry and mine, to dig clay and sand, to hack out eight cubic yards of gold-bearing ore with a pick and haul them to the screening apparatus. Yes, and just to dig in the earth, just to chew up earth, flinty soil, and in winter, to cut coal underground, and there are ores there too, lead and copper. Yes, and one can also pulverize copper ore, a sweet taste in the mouth, and one waters at the nose. One can impregnate ties with creosote, and one's whole body at the same time, too. One can carve out tunnels for railroads and build roadbeds. One can dig peat in the bog up to one's waist in the mud. One can smelt ores. One can cast metal. One can cut hay on hummocks in swampy meadows, sinking up to one's ankles in water. One can be a stable man or a dray man, yes, and steal oats from the horse's bag for one's own pot, but the horse's government issue the old grass bag, and she'll last it out, most likely, but you can drop dead. Yes, and generally the selkhozi, the agricultural camps, you can do every kind of peasant work, and there is no work better than that. You'll grab something from the ground for yourself. But the father of all is our Russian forest with its genuinely golden tree trunks. Gold is mined from them. And the oldest of all the kinds of work in the archipelago is logging. It summons everyone to itself and has room for everyone. And it is not even out of bounds for cripples. They will send out a three-man gang of armless men to stamp down the foot and a half snow. Snow comes up to your chest. You are a lumberjack. First you yourself stamp it down next to the tree trunk. You cut down the tree. Then, hardly able to make your way through the snow, you cut off all the branches, and you have to feel them out in the snow and get to them with your axe. Still dragging your way through the same loose snow, you have to carry off all the branches and make piles of them and burn them. They smoke. They don't burn. And now you have to saw up the wood to size and stack it. And the work norm for you and your brother for the day is six and a half cubic yards each, or thirteen cubic yards for two men working together. In Burepolon, the norm was nine cubic yards, but the thick pieces also had to be split into blocks. By then your arms would not be capable of lifting an axe, nor your feet of moving. During the war years, on war rations, the camp inmates called three weeks at logging dry execution. You come to hate this forest, this beauty of the earth, whose praises have been sung in verse and prose. You come to walk beneath the arches of pine and birch with a shudder of revulsion. For decades in the future, you only have to shut your eyes to see those same fir and aspen trunks which you have hauled on your back to the freight car, sinking into the snow and falling down and hanging on to them tight afraid to let go lest you prove unable to lift them out of the snowy mash. 
Work at hard labor in Tsarist Russia was limited for decades by the normative statutes of 1869, which were actually issued for free persons. In assigning work, the physical strength of the worker and the degree to which he was accustomed to it were taken into consideration. Can one nowadays really believe this? The workday was set at seven hours in winter and at twelve and a half hours in summer. At the ferocious Akatui hard labor center, Yakubovich in the 1890s, the work norms were easily fulfilled by everyone except him. The summer workday there amounted to eight hours, including walking to and from work. And from October on it was seven hours, and in winter only six. And this was even before any struggle for the universal eight-hour workday. As for Dostoyevsky's hard labor in Omsk, it is clear that in general they simply loafed about, as any reader can establish. The work there was agreeable and went with a swing, and the prison administration there even dressed them up in white linen jackets and trousers. Now, how much further could they have gone? In our camps, they used to say, you could even put on a white collar, which meant things were very, very easy and there was absolutely nothing to do. And they had even white jackets. After work, the hard labor convicts of the House of the Dead used to spend a long time strolling around the prison courtyard. That means that they were not totally fagged out. Indeed, the Tsarist censor did not want to pass the manuscript of the House of the Dead for fear that the easiness of the life depicted by Dostoevsky would fail to deter people from crime. And so Dostoevsky added new pages for the censor which demonstrated that life in hard labor was nonetheless hard. In our camps, only the trustees went strolling round on Sundays. Yes, and even they hesitated to. And Shalomov remarks with respect to the notes of Maria Volkonskaya that the Decembrist prisoners in Nerchinsk had a norm of 118 pounds of ore to mine and load each day. 118 pounds? One could lift that all at once. Whereas Shalomov on the Kolyma had a work norm per day of 28,800 pounds. And Shalomov writes that in addition, their summer work day was sometimes 16 hours long. I don't know how it was with 16, but for many it was 13 hours long on earth-moving work in Karlag and at the northern logging operations. And these were hours on the job itself, over and above the three miles walk to the forest and three back. And anyway, why should we argue about the length of the day? After all, the work norm was senior in rank to the length of the workday, and when the brigade didn't fulfill the norm, the only thing that was changed at the end of the shift was the convoy, and the work sloggers were left in the woods by the light of searchlights until midnight, so that they got back to the camp just before morning, in time to eat their dinner, along with their breakfast, and go out into the woods again. Those who increase work norms in industry can still deceive themselves into thinking that such are the successes of the technology of production. But those who increase the norms of physical labor are executioners par excellence. They cannot seriously believe that under socialism the human being is twice as big and twice as muscular. They are the ones who should be tried. They are the ones who should be sent out to fulfill those work norms. There is no one to tell about it either. They all died. And then here's another way they raised the norms and proved it was possible to fulfill them. In cold, lower than 60 degrees below zero, work days were written off. In other words, on such days the records showed that the workers had not gone out to work, but they chased them out anyway, and whatever they squeezed out of them on those days was added to the other days, thereby raising the percentages. And the servile medical section wrote off those who froze to death on such cold days on some other basis. And the ones who were left who could no longer walk and were straining every sinew to crawl along on all fours on the way back to camp, the convoy simply shot so that they wouldn't escape before they could come back to get them. And how did they feed them in return? They poured water into a pot, and the best one might expect was that they would drop unscrubbed small potatoes into it, but otherwise black cabbage, beet tops, all kinds of trash or else vetch or bran. They didn't begrudge these. 
And wherever there was a water shortage, as there was at the Samarkar camp near Karaganda, only one bowl of gruel was cooked a day, and they also gave out a ration of two cups of turbid, salty water. Everything any good was always, and without fail, stolen for the chiefs, see chapter 9, for the trustees and for the thieves. The cooks were all terrorized, and it was only by submissiveness that they kept their jobs. Certain amounts of fat and meat sub-products, in other words, not real food, were assigned out from the warehouses, as were fish, peas, and cereals. But not much of that ever found its way into the mouth of the pot. And in remote places, the chiefs even took all the salt for themselves for their own pickling. In 1940, on the Kotlas Vorkuta Railroad, both the bread and the gruel were unsalted. The worse the food, the more of it they gave the zeks. They used to give them horse meat from exhausted horses driven to death at work. And even though it was quite impossible to chew it, it was a feast. Ivan Dobriak recalls today, In my own time I have pushed no small amount of dolphin meat into my mouth, also walrus, seal, sea bear, and all kinds of other sea animal trash. I interrupt, we ate whale meat in Moscow at the Kaluga gates. I was not even afraid of animal feces, and as for willow herbs, lichens, wild chamomile, they were the very best of dishes. This means he himself went out and added to his rations. It was impossible to try to keep nourished on gulag norms anyone who worked out in the bitter cold for thirteen or even ten hours, and it was completely impossible once the basic ration had been plundered. And this was where Frenkel's satanic mixing paddle was put into the boiling pot. Some sloggers would be fed at the expense of others. The pots were divvied up. If less than thirty percent of the norm, and in each different camp this was calculated in a different way, was fulfilled, the ration issued you was a punishment block ration, ten and a half ounces of bread and a bowl of gruel a day. For from thirty to eighty percent of norm, they issued a penalty ration of fourteen ounces of bread a day and two bowls of gruel. For from eighty-one to one hundred percent, you got a work ration of from seventeen and a half to twenty-one ounces of bread and three bowls of gruel. And after that came the shock workers' pots, and they differed among themselves, running from twenty-four and a half to thirty-one and a half ounces of bread a day and supplementary kasha portions two portions, and the bonus dish, which was some kind of dark, bitterish, rye dough fingers stuffed with peas. And for all this watery food, which could not possibly cover what the body expended, the muscles burned up at body-rending toil. The shock workers and stakhanovites went into the ground sooner than did the malingerers. This was something the old camp veterans understood very well, and it was covered by their own saying, Better not to give me an extra kasha, and not to wake me up for work. If such a happy stroke of fortune befalls you, as to be allowed to stay on your bunk for lack of clothing, you'll get the guaranteed twenty-one ounces. If they have dressed you up for the season, and this is a famous gulag expression, and taken you out to work on the canal, even if you wear your sledgehammer down to a chisel, you'll never get more than ten and a half ounces out of the frozen soil but the Zek was not at liberty to stay on his bunk. Of course, they did not feed the Zek so badly everywhere and always, but these are typical figures for Kraslag in wartime. At Vorkuta in that same period, the miners' ration was in all likelihood the highest in all of Gulag, because heroic Moscow was being heated with that coal. It was forty-five and a half ounces for eighty percent of norm underground or one hundred percent on the surface. And in that most horribly murderous czarist hard labor Akatui, on a non-working day, spent on the bunk. They used to give out two and a half Russian pounds of bread, thirty-five ounces, as well as thirty-two zolotniks, in other words, four point six five ounces of meat. And on a working day, there they gave out three Russian pounds, forty-three ounces of bread, and forty-eight zolotniks, seven ounces of meat. Was that not maybe higher than the front-line ration in the Red Army? And the Akatui prisoners carted off their gruel and their kasha by the tubful to the jailer's pigs. 
and P. Yakubovich found their thin porridge made from buckwheat kasha, Gulag never even saw that, inexpressibly repulsive to the taste. Danger of death from malnutrition is something else that never hung over the hard labor convicts of Dostoevsky's book. And what can you say if geese went wandering around in their prison yard in the camp compound and the prisoners didn't wring their necks? On the basis of the standards of many harsh camps, Shalomov justly reproached me. And what kind of a hospital cat was it that was walking around where you were? Why hadn't they killed it and eaten it long before? The bread at Tsarist Akatui was set out on their tables unrestricted, and at Christmas they were given a pound of beef and unlimited butter for their cereal. On Sakhalin, the Tsarist prisoners working on roads and in mines during the months of the most work received each day 56 ounces of bread, 14 ounces of meat, eight and three-quarter ounces of cereal. And the conscientious Chekhov investigated whether these norms were really enough or whether, in view of the inferior quality of the baking and cooking, they fell short. And if he had looked into the bowl of our Soviet slogger, he would have given up the ghost right then and there. What imagination at the beginning of our century could have pictured that after thirty or forty years, not just on Sakhalin alone, but throughout the entire archipelago, prisoners would be glad to get even more soggy, dirty, slack-baked bread, with admixtures of the devil only knew what, and the twenty-four and a half ounces of it would be an enviable shock-worker ration. No, even more, that throughout all Russia the collective farmers would even envy that prisoner's ration. We don't get even that, after all. Even at the Tsar's Nerchinsk mines, they gave a supplementary gold prospector's payment for everything over the government norm, which was always moderate. In our camps, for most of the years of the archipelago, they either paid nothing for labor or just as much as was required for soap and tooth powder. Only in those rare camps and in those short periods when for some reason they introduced cost accounting, and only from one-eighth to one-fourth of the genuine wage was credited to the prisoner, could the Zeks buy bread, meat, and sugar? And all of a sudden, oh, astonishment, a crust would be left on the mess hall table, and it might be there for all of five minutes, without anyone reaching out a hand to grab it. And how were our natives dressed and shod? All archipelagos are like all archipelagos. The, the blue ocean rolls about them, coconut palms grow on them, and the administration of the islands does not assume the expense of clothing the natives. They go about barefoot and almost naked. But as for our cursed archipelago, it would have been quite impossible to picture it beneath the hot sun. It was eternally covered with snow, and the blizzards eternally raged over it. And in addition to everything else, it was necessary to clothe and to shoe all that horde of ten to fifteen million prisoners. According to the estimates of the encyclopedia Rossiya SSSR, there were up to 15 million prisoners at a time. This figure agrees with the estimate made by prisoners inside the USSR, as we ourselves have added it up. Whenever they publish more proven figures, we will accept them. Fortunately, born outside the bounds of the archipelago, the Zeks arrived here not altogether naked. They wore what they came in, more accurately, what the socially friendly elements might leave of it, except that, as a brand of the archipelago, a piece had to be torn off, just as they clip one ear of the ram. Greatcoats have their flaps cut off diagonally, Budeni helmets have the high peak cut off, so as to leave a draught through the top. But alas, the clothing of free men is not eternal, and footgear can be in shreds in a week from the stumps and hummocks of the archipelago and therefore it is necessary to clothe the natives, even though they have nothing with which to pay for the clothing. Some day the Russian stage will yet see this sight, and the Russian cinema screen, the pea jackets one color and their sleeves another, or so many patches on the pea jacket that its original cloth is totally invisible, or a flaming pea jacket with tatters on it like tongues of flame or patches on breeches made from the wrappings of someone's food parcel from home. And for a long while to come, one can still read the address written in the corner with an indelible pencil. 
In Tsarist Akatui, the prisoners were given fur overcoats. And on their feet the tried and true Russian lapti, bast sandals, except that they had no decent onuchi, footcloths, to go with them. Or else they might have a piece of old automobile tire tied right on the barefoot with a wire, an electric cord. Grief has its own uninventiveness. Or else there were felt boots, burki, put together from pieces of old, torn-up, padded jackets, with soles made of a layer of thick felt and a layer of rubber. Neither Dostoevsky, nor Chekhov, nor Yakubovich tells us what the prisoners of their own Tsarist times wore on their feet, but of course they were doubtless shod, otherwise they would have written about it. In the morning at the gatehouse, hearing complaints about the cold, the chief of the camp would reply with his gulag sense of humour, My goose out there goes around barefoot all winter long and doesn't complain, although it's true her feet are red, and all of you have got rubber overshoes. And then, in addition, bronze-grey camp faces will appear on the screen, eyes oozing with tears, red eyelids, white cracked lips covered with sores, skew-balled, unshaven bristles on the faces. In winter, a summer cap with ear flaps sewn on. I recognize you. It is you, the inhabitants of my archipelago. But no matter how many hours there are in the working day, sooner or later sloggers will return to the barracks. Their barracks? Sometimes it is a dugout dug into the ground, and in the north more often a tent, true with earth banked and reinforced hit or miss with boards, Often there are kerosene lamps in place of electricity, but sometimes there are the ancient Russian splinter lamps, or else cotton wool wicks. In Ostvim, for two years, they saw no kerosene, and even in headquarters barracks they got light from oil from the food store. It is by this pitiful light that we will survey this ruined world. Sleeping shelves in two stories, sleeping shelves in three stories, or, as a sign of luxury, Vagonki, multiple bunks, the boards most often bare and nothing at all on them. On some of the work parties they steal so thoroughly and then sell the spoils through the free employees that nothing government issue is given out and no one keeps anything of his own in the barracks. They take both their mess tins and their mugs to work with them and even tote the bags containing their belongings and thus laden they dig in the earth. Those who have them put their blankets around their necks, a film scene, or else lug their things to trusty friends in a guarded barracks. During the day, the barracks are as empty as if uninhabited. At night, they might turn over their wet work clothes to be dried in the dryer, if there is a dryer, but undressed like that, you are going to freeze on the bare boards, and so they dry their clothes on themselves. At night, their caps may freeze to the wall of the tent, or in a woman's case, her hair. They even hide their bast sandals under their heads so they won't be stolen off their feet, Burepolom, during the war. In the middle of the barracks there is an oil drum with holes in it which has been converted into a stove, and it is good when it gets red hot, then the steamy odor of drying footcloths permeates the entire barracks, but it sometimes happens that the wet firewood in it doesn't burn some of the barracks are so infested with insects that even four days' fumigation with burning sulphur doesn't help. And when in the summer the zecks go out to sleep on the ground in the camp compound, the bed bugs crawl after them and find them even there. And the zecks boil the lice off their underwear in their mess tins after dining from them. All this became possible only in the twentieth century, and comparison here with the prison chroniclers of the past century is to no avail. They didn't write of anything like this. It is necessary to add to all this the picture of the way the brigade's bread is brought on a tray from the bread-cutting room into the mess hall under guard of the huskiest brigade members carrying staves. Otherwise, other prisoners will grab it, tear it apart, and run off with it. And the picture should also be added of the way food parcels from home are knocked out of the Zek's hands at the very moment they leave the parcel office and also the constant alarm whether the camp administration is going to take away the rest day, 
And why talk about the war if for a whole year before the war they had not had one day off on the Uchta State Farm? And no one in Carlag could remember any rest days from 1937 right through 1945. Then, on top of everything, one has to add the eternal impermanence of camp life, the fear of change, rumors about a prisoner transport, the prisoner transport itself. The hard labor of Dostoevsky's time knew no prisoner transports, and for ten or even twenty years people served out their term in one prison, and that was a totally different kind of life. Then some sort of dark and sudden shuffling of contingents, either a transfer in the interests of production, or a commissioning by a medical review board, or inventory of property, or sudden night searches that involve undressing and the tearing apart of all the prisoners' meager rags, and then beyond that the thorough individual searches before the big holidays of May the first and November seventh. The Christmas and Easter of hard labor in the past century knew nothing like this. And three times a month there were the fatal, ruinous baths. To avoid repetition, I will not write about them here. There is a detailed story investigation in Shalomov, and a story by Dombrovsky. And later there was that constant clinging, and for an intellectual torturing, lack of privacy. The condition of not being an individual but a member of a brigade instead, and the necessity of acting for whole days and whole years, not as you yourself have decided, but as the brigade requires. And one must remember as well that everything that has been said refers to the established camp in operation for some time, but that camp had to be started at some time and by someone, and by whom, if not by our unhappy brothers X, of course. They came to a cold, snowy woods. They stretched wire on the trees, and whoever managed to survive until the first barracks knew those barracks would be for the guard anyway. In November 1941, near the station of Reshoti, Camp Number One of Krasnag was opened. Over a ten-year period, they increased to seventeen. They drove 250 soldiers there, removed from the army to strengthen it morally. They cut timber. They built log frames. But there was nothing to cover the roofs with, and so they lived with iron stoves beneath the sky. The bread brought them was frozen, and they chopped it up with an axe and gave it out in handfuls, broken up, crushed up, crummy. Their other food was heavily salted humpback salmon. It burned their mouths, and they eased the burning with snow. When you remember the heroes of the War of the Fatherland, do not forget these. Now that is the way of life of my archipelago. Philosophers, psychologists, medical men, and writers could have observed in our camps as nowhere else, in detail and on a large scale, the special process of the narrowing of the intellectual and spiritual horizons of a human being, the reduction of the human being to an animal, and the process of dying alive. But the psychologists who got into our camps were, for the most part, not up to observing. They themselves had fallen into that very same stream that was dissolving the personality into feces and ash. Just as nothing that contains life can exist without getting rid of its wastes, so the archipelago could not keep swirling about without precipitating to the bottom its principal form of waste, the last leggers. And everything built by the archipelago had been squeezed out of the muscles of the last leggers, before they became last leggers. And those who survived, who reproach the last leggers with being themselves to blame, must take upon themselves the disgrace of their own preserved lives. And among the surviving, the orthodox communists now write me lofty protests. How base are the thoughts and feelings of the heroes of your story! One day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, where are their anguished cogitations about the course of history? Everything is about bread rations and gruel, and yet there are sufferings much more unbearable than hunger. Oh, so there are! Oh, so there are indeed much more unbearable sufferings, such as sufferings of orthodox thought. You in your medical sections and your storerooms, you never knew hunger there. Orthodox, loyalist, gentlemen. It has been known for centuries that hunger rules the world. 
and all your progressive doctrine is, incidentally, built on hunger, on the thesis that hungry people will inevitably revolt against the well-fed. Hunger rules every hungry human being, unless he has himself consciously decided to die. Hunger, which forces an honest person to reach out and steal, when the belly rumbles, conscience flees. Hunger, which compels the most unselfish person to look with envy into someone else's bow, and to try painfully to estimate what weight of ration his neighbor is receiving. Hunger, which darkens the brain and refuses to allow it to be distracted by anything else at all, or to think about anything else at all, or to speak about anything else at all except food, food, and food. Hunger, from which it is impossible to escape even in dreams. Dreams are about food, and insomnia is over food. And soon, just insomnia. Hunger, after which one cannot even eat up. The man has by then turned into a one-way pipe, and everything emerges from him in exactly the same state in which it was swallowed. And this, too, the Russian cinema screen must see, how the last leggers, jealously watching their competitors out of the corners of their eyes, stand duty at the kitchen porch, waiting for them to bring out the slops in the dishwater, how they throw themselves on it and fight with one another, seeking a fish head, a bone, vegetable parings, and how one last legger dies killed in that scrimmage, and how immediately afterward they wash off this waste and boil it and eat it. And inquisitive cameramen can continue with their shooting and show us how, in 1947, in Dolinka, Bessarabian peasant women who had been brought in from freedom hurled themselves with that very same intent on slops which the last leggers had already checked over. The screen will show bags of bones which are still joined together, lying under blankets of the hospital, dying almost without movement, and then being carried out. And on the whole, how simply a human being dies. He was speaking, and he fell silent. He was walking along the road, and he fell down. Shudder, and it's over. How, in camp at Unja and Nuksha, the fat-faced, socially friendly worker signer jerks a zek by the legs to get him out to line up, and he turns out to be dead, and the corpse falls on its head on the floor. Croaked, the scum! And he gaily gives him a kick for good measure. At those camps during the war there was no doctor's aid, not even an orderly, and as a result there were no sick, and anyone who pretended to be sick was taken out to the woods in his comrade's arms, and they also took a board and a rope along so they could drag the corpse back the more easily. At work they laid the sick person down next to the bonfire, and it was to the interest of both the Zex and the convoy to have him die the sooner. What the screen cannot catch will be described to us in slow, meticulous prose, which will distinguish between the nuances of the various paths to death, which are sometimes called scurvy, sometimes pellagra, sometimes alimentary dystrophy. For instance, if there is blood on your bread after you have taken a bite, that is scurvy. From then on, your teeth begin to fall out, your gums rot, ulcers appear on your legs, your flesh will begin to fall off in whole chunks, and you will begin to smell like a corpse. Your bloated legs collapse. They refuse to take such cases into the hospital, and they crawl on all fours around the camp compound. But if your face grows dark, and your skin begins to peel, and your entire organism is racked by diarrhea, this is pellagra. It is necessary to halt the diarrhoea somehow, so they take three spoons of chalk a day, and they say that in this case if you can get and eat a lot of herring, the food will begin to hold. But where are you going to get herring? The man grows weaker, weaker, and the bigger he is, the faster it goes. He has already become so weak that he cannot climb to the top bunks. He cannot step across a log in his path. He has to lift his leg with his two hands or else crawl on all fours. The diarrhea takes out of a man both strength and all interest in other people, in life, in himself. He grows deaf and stupid, and he loses all capacity to weep, even when he is being dragged along the ground behind a sledge. He is no longer afraid of death. 
He is wrapped in a submissive, rosy glow. He has crossed all boundaries and has forgotten the name of his wife, of his children, and finally his own name too. Sometimes the entire body of a man dying of starvation is covered with blue-black pimples like peas, with pus-filled heads smaller than a pinhead. His face, arms, legs, his trunk, even his scrotum. It is so painful. He cannot be touched. The tiny boils come to a head and burst, and a thick worm-like string of pus is forced out of them. The man is rotting alive. If black, astonished head lice are crawling on the face of your neighbour on the bunks, it is a sure sign of death. Fie! What naturalism! Why keep talking about all that? And that is what they usually say today. Those who did not themselves suffer, who were themselves the executioners, or who have washed their hands of it, or who put on an innocent expression, why remember all that? Why rake over old wounds, their wounds? Lev Tolstoy had an answer for that, to Biryukov. What do you mean? Why remember? If I have had a terrible illness and I have succeeded in recovering from it and been cleansed of it. I will always remember gladly. The only time I will refuse to remember is when I am still ill and have got worse, and when I wish to deceive myself. If we remember the old and look it straight in the face, then our new and present violence will also disclose itself. I want to conclude these pages about last leggers with N. K. G.'s story about the engineer Lev Nikolaevich Y. Indeed, this must, in view of the first name and patronymic, be in honour of Tolstoy, a last legger theoretician who found the last legger's pattern of existence to be the most convenient method of preserving his life. Here is how the engineer Y occupies himself in a remote corner of the camp compound on a hot Sunday. Something. With a resemblance to a human being, sits in a declivity above a pit in which brown peaty water has collected. Set out around the pit are sardine heads, fish bones, pieces of gristle, crusts of bread, lumps of cooked cereal, wet washed potato peelings, and something in addition which it is difficult even to name. A tiny bonfire has been built on a piece of tin, and above it hangs a soot blackened soldier's mess tin containing a broth. It seems to be ready. The last legger begins to dip out the dark slops from the mess tin with a wooden spoon, and to wash down with them one after another the potato peelings, the gristle, then the sardine heads. He keeps chewing away very, very slowly and deliberately. It's the common misfortune of last leggers to gulp things down hastily without chewing. His nose can hardly be seen in the midst of the dark grey wool that covers his neck. His chin, his cheeks, his nose, and his forehead are a waxy brown colour, and in places the skin is peeling. His eyes are teary and blink frequently. Noticing the approach of an outsider, the last legger quickly gathers up everything set out there which he has not yet eaten, presses his mess tin to his chest, falls to the ground, and curls up in a ball like a hedgehog. And now he can be beaten, shoved, but he is firmly on the ground. He won't stir, and he won't give up his mess tin. N. K. G. speaks to him in a friendly voice, and the hedgehog uncurls a bit. He sees his visitor does not intend to beat him or take away his mess tin. A conversation ensues. They are both engineers. N. G. a geologist, and Y. a chemist. And now Y. discloses to G. his own faith. Basing himself on his still remembered formulas for the chemical composition of substances, he demonstrates that one can get everything nutritionally necessary from refuse. One merely has to overcome one's squeamishness and direct all one's efforts to extracting nourishment from this source. Notwithstanding the heat, Y is dressed in several layers of clothes, all dirty, and he had a basis for this too. Why had established experimentally that lice and fleas will not multiply in extremely dirty clothing, as though they themselves were squeamish. Therefore, he had even picked out for one of his undergarments a piece of wiping in the repair shop. Here was how he looked. 
He wore a Budeni helmet with a black candle stump in place of the spiked peak. The helmet was covered with scorch marks. In some places hay and in some places oakum adhered to the greasy elephant ears of the helmet. From his outer clothing, torn pieces and tatters stuck out like tongues on his back and sides. Patches and patches. A layer of tar on one side. The cotton wool lining was hanging out in a fringe along the hem. Both outer sleeves were torn to the elbows, and when the last legger raised his arms, he looked like a bat shaking its wings. And on his feet were boat-like rubber overshoes glued together from red automobile tires. Why was he dressed so warmly? In the first place, the summer was short and the winter long, and it was necessary to keep everything he had for the winter, and where else could he keep it except on himself? In the second place, the principal reason he created by this means a soft and well-padded exterior, and thus did not feel pain when he was struck. He could be kicked and beaten with sticks without getting bruised. This was his one defence. All he had to do was be quick enough to see who was about to strike him, drop to the ground in time, pull his knees up to his stomach, thus covering it, press his head down to his chest, and embrace it with his thickly padded arms. Then the only places they could hit him were padded, and so that no one should beat him for too long at a time, it was necessary quickly to give the person beating him a feeling of triumph. And to this end, Wire had learned to howl hideously like a piglet from the very first blow, even though he wasn't hurting in the least. For in camp, they are very fond of beating up the weak, not only the worker signers and the brigadiers, but the ordinary zacks as well, so as not to feel completely weak themselves. And what was to be done if people simply could not believe in their own strength unless they subjected others to cruelty? And to why this seemed a fully endurable and reasonably chosen way of life, and one in addition which did not require him to soil his conscience? He did nobody harm. He hoped to survive his term. The interview with the last legger is over. In our glorious fatherland, which was capable for more than a hundred years of not publishing the work of Chadayev because of his reactionary views, you see, you are not likely to surprise anyone with the fact that the most important and boldest books are never read by contemporaries, never exercise an influence on popular thought in good time. And thus it is that I am writing this book solely from a sense of obligation, because too many stories and recollections have accumulated in my hands, and I cannot allow them to perish. I do not expect to see it in print anywhere with my own eyes, and I have little hope that those who manage to drag their bones out of the archipelago will ever read it. And I do not at all believe that it will explain the truth of our history in time for anything to be corrected. In the very heat of working on this book, I was struck by the greatest shock of my life. The dragon emerged for one minute, licked up my novel with his wicked, rough red tongue, and several other old works, and retired behind the curtain for the time. But I can hear his breathing, and I know that his teeth are aimed at my neck. That it is just that my time is not up yet. And with devastated soul, I am going to gather my strength to complete this investigation, so that it at least may escape the dragon's teeth. In the days when Sholokov, who has long since ceased to be a writer, journeyed from this country of harried and arrested writers to receive a Nobel Prize, I was trying to duck the dicks. Seeking a hiding place and trying to win time for my clandestine panting pen to complete this very book, I have digressed. But what I wanted to say was that in our country the best books remain unknown to their contemporaries, and it is very possible that I am therefore vainly repeating the secret work of someone else. When, had I known of it, I could have made my own work shorter. But during the seven years of our frail and pale freedom, some things did nevertheless emerge. Despite everything, and one swimmer in the dawn-lit ocean has spied another head and cried out in a wheezy voice to him. And it was in this way that I learned of Shalamov's sixty camp stories and of his study of the thieves. I want to declare here that, apart from several individual points on which we disagree, no difference of interpretation has ever arisen between us in explaining the archipelago. He and I evaluate the whole native life in the same way. Shalamov's camp experience was more bitter and longer than mine, and I acknowledge with esteem that it fell to him rather than to me to plumb those depths of beastliness and despair, 
to which the whole camp way of life was dragging us all down. This, however, does not prohibit my raising objections to specific points on which we disagree. One such point is the evaluation of the camp medical section. Shalomov speaks with hate and gall, and rightly too, of every camp establishment, but he always makes a biased exception solely for the medical section. He supports, if he does not create, a legend about the benign camp medical section. He affirms that everything in the camp was against the camp inmate except the doctor. He alone could help him. That he can help still doesn't mean that he does. He can help, if he so desires, just as the construction superintendent, the norm setter, the bookkeeper, the storeroom clerk, the cook, the orderly, and the work assigner can, too. But do many of them actually help? Perhaps up to 1932, when the camp medical sections were still subordinate to the People's Commissariat of Health, the doctors could still be doctors. But in 1932, the medical sections were turned over in toto to Gulag, and it became their goal to help the oppressors and to be grave diggers. So, leaving aside the good cases with good doctors, just who would have kept those medical sections in the archipelago at all if they had not served the common purpose? When the commandant and the brigadier beat up on a last legger because he refused to go out to work, so badly that he was left licking his wounds like a dog and lay unconscious for two days in a punishment cell, Babich, and for two months afterward could not even crawl down from the bunks, was it not the medical section, at camp number one of the Chida group of camps, that refused to draw up official certification of the beating and subsequently to treat him? And who was it, if not the medical section, that signed every decree for imprisonment in the punishment block? Incidentally, let us not lose sight of the fact that the chiefs did not have all that great a need for that doctor's signature. In the camp near the Indirgikar, S. A. Chebotaryov was a free plasterer, a medical assistant, this term being, not by chance, a piece of camp slang, too. He did not sign a single one of the camp chief's decrees for imprisonment in the punishment block, since he considered that even a dog shouldn't be put in such a punishment block, let alone people. The stove only warmed the jailer out in the corridor. That was all right. Incarcerations took place there without his signature. When, through the fault of the construction superintendent or the foreman, or because of the absence of fencing or safety precautions, a Zeg died at work, who was it if not the medical assistant and the medical section that signed the certificate attesting that he had died of a heart attack. And what that meant was that everything could be left just as it was and tomorrow others would die. Otherwise, the medical assistant would soon be working at the mine face himself and the doctor, too. When quarterly commissioning took place, that comedy of general medical examination of the camp population with assignment to categories, TFT, heavy physical labor, SFT, average physical labor, LFT, light physical labor, and IFT, individual physical labor. Were there many good doctors who opposed the evil chief of the medical section, who was kept in his job only because he supplied columns for heavy labor? Or perhaps the medical section was at least merciful to those willing to sacrifice a part of their own bodies in order to save the rest. Everyone knows the law, not just in one camp or another, Self-mutilators, self-maimers, and self-incapacitators were refused all medical help. This was an administration order, but who actually refused the help? The doctors. Let's say you've blown off four of your fingers with a dynamite cap, and you've come to the infirmary. They give you no bandage. Drop dead, dog. And back at the Moscow Volga Canal during the wave of universal competition, for some reason. Too many cases of self-maiming suddenly appeared, and there was an immediate explanation. This was a sally of the class enemy, and was one then to treat them? Of course, much depended here on the cleverness of the Zek who had maimed himself. It was possible to do it in such a way that it could not be proved. And Bernstein scalded his hand adroitly with boiling water poured through a cloth, and thus saved his life. Another might adroitly freeze his hand by not wearing a mitten, or else urinate in his felt boots and go out into the bitter cold. But you couldn't take everything into account. Gangrene could set in, and death would follow. 
Sometimes there were cases of unforeseen self-incapacitation. Babbage's unhealing scurvy ulcers were diagnosed as syphilis, and there was nowhere to make a blood test. He thereupon cheerfully lied that he and his entire family had syphilis. He was moved into the venereal disease zone of the camp, and by this means he postponed his death. Was there ever a time when the medical section excused from work all the prisoners genuinely ill on a given day, or when it didn't drive a given number of seriously ill people out of the camp compound to work? Dr. Suleymanov refused to put Pyotr Kishkin, the hero and comedian of the Zek people, into the hospital because his diarrhea did not satisfy the norm. Every half hour, and it had to be bleeding. So, when the column formed up to go to the worksite, Kishkin sat down, running the risk of getting shot. But the convoy turned out to be more merciful than the doctor. They stopped a passing car and sent Kishkin to the hospital. People will object that the medical section was held to a strictly limited percentage of Group C, inpatients and ambulatory cases. Doctors got around that as best they could. In Sim Camp, they organized a semi-hospital. The last leggers lay there on their pea jackets and went out to shovel snow, but were fed from the hospital rations. The free chief of the medical department, A. M. Statnikov, got around the Group C quota in the following way: he cut back on the hospitals and the working compounds, but in turn expanded the hospital camps, that is, camps entirely for the sick. In the official Gulag documents, they sometimes even wrote. Raise the physical fitness of the Zex, but they refuse to give any funds for this purpose. In fact, the very complexity of these subterfuges of honest physicians proves that the medical sections were not allowed to interfere with the death process. So there was an explanation in every case, but in every case there also remained a cruelty in no wise outweighed by the consideration that, on the other hand, they were doing good to someone else. And then we have to bring in here the horrible camp hospitals, like the one at Camp Number Two of Krivoschekovo, a small reception room, a toilet, and a hospital room. The toilet stank and filled the hospital air, but was that the worst of it? In each hospital cot lay two diarrhoea patients, and others were lying on the floor between cots. Those who had grown weak evacuated in their cots. There were no linens or medicines. 1948 to 1949, the hospital was run by a third-year medical student, a 58 himself. He was desperate, but there was nothing he could do. The hospital orderlies, who were supposed to feed the patients, were strong, fat young fellows. They ate the patients' food, stealing from their hospital ration. Who had put them in their cushy spots? The godfather, no doubt. The student didn't have the strength to get rid of them. Or defend the patient's rations, but would any doctor have had it either? Dostoevsky entered the hospital without any hindrance, and the medical section in his prison was the same for both prisoners and convoy. What immaturity! Or could it possibly be contended that the medical section in every camp was able to insist on really human nutrition? Well. At least to the extent of not having those night-blind brigades returning from work in the evenings in a line of the night-blind clinging to one another. No, if by some miracle some intervention did secure an improvement in nutrition, it would only have been the work administration, so as to have strong sloggers, and certainly never the medical section. No one is blaming the physicians for all this, though their courage to resist was often weak because they were afraid of being sent to general work. But the legends about the saviors from the medical sections aren't needed either. Like every branch of the camp administration, the medical section too was born of the devil and filled with the devil's blood. Continuing his thought, Shalomov says that the prisoner in camp could count only on the medical section. And that he could not count on the work of his own hands; that he did not dare. This led to the grave. In camp, it is not the small ration that kills, but the big one. The saying is true: the big ration is the one that kills. In one season of hauling timber, the strongest slogger would end up a hopeless last legger himself. At that point, he would be certified a temporary invalid. Fourteen ounces of bread and gruel from the bottom-ranking pot. 
During the winter, a number of such people died. Well, say, 725 out of 800. The rest of them went on to light physical work and died on that. So what other way out can we offer Ivan Denisovich if they're unwilling to take him on as a medical assistant or a hospital attendant and also won't fake him a release from work for even one day? If he is too short on schooling and too long on conscience to get himself fixed up with a job as trustee in the camp compound. Is there any other course left him than to put his trust in his own two hands? What about the rest point, the OP? What about maiming himself? And what about early release on medical grounds, Aktirovka? Let Ivan Denisovich talk about them in his own words, for he has given them plenty of thought. He had the time. The rest point, the OP, that's like a camp rest home. Tens of years the Zeks bend their backs, don't get vacations, so they have rest points for two weeks. They feed much better there, and they're not driven outside the camp compound to work. And in the compound they only put in three, four hours of real easy work, pounding rocks to pave roads, cleaning up the compound, or making repairs. And if there were half a thousand people in the camp, they'd open a rest point for fifteen. And then, if everything had been divided up honestly, everyone would have gotten rest point once in just over a year. But just as there was no justice in anything in camp, there was especially none with rest points. They would open up a rest point sneakily, the way a dog snaps, and right off there would be lists ready for three whole shifts there. Then they would shut it down quick as a wink, too. It wouldn't last half a year. The types who pushed in would be the bookkeepers, barbers, shoemakers, tailors. The whole aristocracy, with just a few real sloggers thrown in for the look of the thing. The best workers, they said. And then the tailor, Berembliom, would shove under your nose... I made a fur coat for somebody outside and a thousand rubles was paid the camp cashier for it. And you, idiot, haul beams a whole month and the camp doesn't even get a hundred rubles for you. So who's the best worker? Who should get rest point? And so there you go around, your heart bleeding, trying to figure how to get into rest point just to catch your breath a little bit. And before you look around, it has already been shut down and that's the end of it. And the sorest point of all is that at least they could enter in your prison file that you had been at a rest point in such and such a year. It wasn't they didn't have enough bookkeepers in camp. No, they wouldn't, because it was no good to them. The next year, they'd open up a rest point again, and again their emblem would be in the first shift, and again you'd be bypassed. In the course of ten years, they'd roll you sideways through ten camps, and in the tenth you'd beg them just to let you poke your nose in the O.P. to see what it was like, whether the walls were painted decently and so on, because after all you'd never been in one your whole term. But how could you prove it? No, no point in getting worked up about the rest points. But maiming yourself was another matter, to cripple yourself but still stay alive and become an invalid. As they say, one minute's endurance and a year of loafing. Break your leg and then stop the bone from knitting right. Drink salt water and swell up, and smoke tea, spoil your heart, or drink stewed tobacco, good for wrecking the lungs. But you had to be careful not to overdo, hurting yourself so badly that you leapfrogged invalidism into the grave, and who knew just how far to go? In many ways, an invalid didn't have things too bad. He might be able to get himself a spot in the cookhouse or the bast sandal shop. But the main thing smart people were looking for in making themselves invalids was early release on health grounds, Aktirovka, except that Aktirovka, especially in waves, was even harder than getting into rest points. They got together a commission, inspected the invalids, and for the very worst of them wrote up an act, a certificate. From such and such a date, because of state of health, so-and-so is classified as unsuited to serve out his term further, and we petition for his release. We only petition, and while this certificate proceeded upward to the higher-ups and then back down again, you could cash in your chips. That happened often. After all, the higher-ups were sly bastards. They released ahead of time on health grounds those who were going to kick the bucket in a month anyway. In O. Volkov's story, Grandfather's, those old men released for bad health were driven out of camp,
but they had nowhere to go and hung on right in the vicinity to die without the bread ration and shelter they had in camp. And also the ones who could pay well. There was a confederate of Kalikman who had got away with half a million. She paid a hundred thousand and went free, not like us fools. There used to be a book going around the barracks and the students read it aloud in their corner. In it there was one fellow who got himself a million and didn't know what to do with his million under Soviet power. There wasn't supposed to be anything to buy and you could die of starvation with it, with that million. We used to laugh, tell that bull to someone else. As for us, we've seen quite a few of those millionaires walk out of camp too. You can't buy God's health back for a million, but you can buy freedom and buy power and buy people too, lock, stock and barrel. And there are Oh, 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 so many of those who have piled up millions out in freedom, too. Only they just don't shout it from the housetops or wave their arms about when they have it. But for the 58s, early release for health is a closed door. During all the time the camps have existed, they say that maybe three times for a month apiece, prisoners sentenced under Section 10 were released early for health, and then that door, too, was slammed shut and no one will take money from them, from the enemies of the people. If you did, you'd be putting your own head on the block in place of theirs. Yes, and they don't have any money, those politicians. What do you mean, Ivan Denisic? They don't have any. Well, all right, we don't have any. But there is one form of early release that no blue cap can take away from the prisoner. This release is death. And this is the most basic, the steadiest form of archipelago output there is, with no norms. From the fall of 1938 to February 1939, at one of the Ustvim camps, 385 out of 550 prisoners died. Certain work brigades, or Gurtsov, died off totally, including the brigadiers. In the autumn of 1941, Petrolag, the railroad camp, had a listed population of 50,000 prisoners, and in the spring of 1942, 10,000. During this period, not one prisoner transport was sent out of Petrolag anywhere, so where did the 40,000 prisoners go? I have written thousand here in italics. Why? Because I learned these figures accidentally from a Zek who had access to them. But you would not be able to get them for all camps in all periods, nor to total them up. In the central sector of Burepolom camp, in the barracks housing the last leggers, in February 1943, out of 50 people there were never fewer than four deaths a night, and one night there were 12. In the morning their places were taken by new last leggers who dreamed of recuperating on a diet of thin magara gruel and 14 ounces of bread. Corpses withered from pellagra, no buttocks, and women with no breasts or rotting from scurvy, were checked out in the morgue cabin and sometimes in the open air. This was seldom like an autopsy, a long vertical cut from neck to crotch, breaking leg bones, pulling the skull apart at its seam. Mostly it was not a surgeon, but a convoy guard who verified the corpse, to be certain the Zek was really dead and not pretending. And for this they ran the corpse through with a bayonet or smashed the skull with a big mallet. And right there they tied to the big toe of the corpse's right foot a tag with his prison file number, under which he was identified in the prison lists. At one time they used to bury them in their underwear, but later on in the very worst, lowest grade, which was dirty grey. And then came an across-the-board regulation not to waste any underwear on them at all. It could still be used for the living, but to bury them naked. At one time, in old Russia, it was thought that a corpse could not get along without a coffin. Even the lowliest serfs, beggars, and tramps were buried in coffins. Even the Sakhalin and the Akatui hard-labor prisoners were buried in coffins. But in the archipelago, this would have amounted to the unproductive expenditure of millions on labor and lumber. When at Inta, after the war, one honored foreman of the woodworking plant was actually buried in a coffin, the cultural and educational section was instructed to make propaganda. Work well, and you too will be buried in a wooden coffin. 
The corpses were hauled away on sledges or on carts, depending on the time of year. Sometimes, for convenience, they used one box for six corpses. And if there were no boxes, then they tied the hands and legs with cords so they didn't flop about. After this, they piled them up like logs and covered them with vast matting. If there was aminal available, a special brigade of grave diggers would dynamite pits for them. Otherwise, they had to dig the graves, always common graves, in the ground, either big ones for a large number or shallow ones for four at a time. In the springtime, a stink used to waft into the camp from the shallower graves, and they would then send last leggers to deepen them. On the other hand, no one can accuse us of gas chambers. Where there was more time to spare on such things, as, for example, in Kengir, they would set out little posts on the hillocks, and a representative of the records and classification section, no less, would personally inscribe on them the inventory numbers of those buried there. However, in Kengir, someone also did some wrecking. Mothers and wives who came there were shown the cemetery, and they went there to mourn and weep. Thereupon, the chief of Steplag, Comrade Colonel Chechev, ordered the bulldozers to bulldoze down the little grave posts and level off the hillocks because of this lack of gratitude. Now that, fair reader, is how your father, your husband, your brother was buried. And that is how the path of the native and his way of life come to an end. But as a matter of fact, it was Pavel Baikov who said, Until twenty-four hours have passed after death, don't be so sure that it's all over. Well, Ivan Denisovich, what is there left that we haven't yet recounted from the routine of our daily lives? Oh, you haven't even begun. It would take as many years as you served to tell it all, like about the Zek who broke formation to chase a cigarette butt and the convoy guard shot him. In Dostoevsky's time, a prisoner could leave formation to beg arms and in formation the prisoners used to chat and sing. How the invalid sex in the kitchen gulped down raw potatoes. Once cooked, they'd not get any. How tea was used in place of money in camps. How they used to brew up a super-strong tea mix, one and three-quarter ounces to a glass, and get a high. But that was mostly the thieves. They used to buy tea from the free employees with stolen money. And how did the Zek manage to live on the whole? If he couldn't manage to weave string from sand, if he wasn't both tight-fisted and ingenious, he couldn't survive. Even in his sleep, the Zek had to keep thinking how to dodge and twist his way through the next day. And if you got your hands on something or sniffed out some loophole, then keep your mouth shut, keep it shut, or else the guys next to you would find out and mess it all up. That's how it is in camp. There just isn't enough for everyone anyway, so see to it there's enough for you. Well, that's as may be, but still, even in camp you have the old human custom of making friends. Not only old friendships, co-defendants or comrades from out in freedom, but new ones made here. People's hearts went out to each other, and they confided in each other. Buddies, whatever we have we share, and whatever we don't, fifty-fifty. It's true that we keep our precious bread ration separate, but everything gotten hold of otherwise is cooked in one mess tin and ladled from the same one. For some reason, in the hard labor regime described by Dostoevsky, friendship did not flourish, and no one paired off even to eat. There were buddies who stayed together a short time, and others who stayed together a long time. Some pairings were based on conscience, and others on deceit. Like a snake, the godfather used to like to crawl in between such friendships, over a common mess tin, and in a whisper you'd talk about everything. The old sects admit, and the former POWs will tell you too, the one who sells you down the river is the one who ate from the mess tin with you. And that's also a partial truth. But the best deal is not to have a buddy, but a girl buddy, a camp wife, a zechka, as they used to say, to get sub-married, what was good if you were young was to her somewhere in a one-night shack up, and that would do your soul good. And even for an old weak guy, it was still good. You could get something anyway, earn a favor. Maybe she would do your washing for you, bring it to your barracks, put your shirt under your pillow, and no one would laugh. It was in the law. She would cook for you, too. 
you would sit down on your cot next to each other and eat. And that kind of camp espousal would suit even an old chap particularly well, just barely warm with a little touch of bitter flavour. You'd look at her through the steam from the mess pot, and there were wrinkles on her face, yes, and on your own too. You were both in grey camp rags, your padded jackets were all stained with rust and clay and lime and alabaster and lubricating grease. You never knew her before, and you had never set foot on her native soil, and she didn't talk like one of ours either. And out in freedom her children were growing up, and yours too. And she had left her husband there too, who was skirt chasing. And your own wife had been left alone too, and she wasn't letting the grass grow under her feet either. After all, eight years, ten years, everyone wants to live. And this, your camp wife, drags the same chain as you do and doesn't complain. And we live, not like people. And we die, not like parents. Some Zex got visits from their real wives. In various camps under various chiefs, they were allowed to sit together for twenty minutes in the gatehouse. And there were even cases where they spent a night or two together in a separate shack if you were a hundred and fifty percenter. But these visits were nothing more than poison. Why touch her with your hands and talk with her about something if you still had years and years to go before living with her again? It split the men in two. With a camp wife, everything is clearer. Between us, we have one cup of grits left. They say we're going to get burnt sugar this coming week. It won't be white, of course. The rats. Lathe operator Rodichev's wife came to visit him, and just before she arrived, his shack up bit him on the neck while making love. Rodichev swore a blue streak because his wife was coming, and off he went to the medical section to get a bandage put on his bruise. I can say I caught cold. And what kind of women were there in camp? There were women thieves, and there were loose women, and there were politicals. But most of all, there were lowly and humble women sent there under the decree. They were all sent up under the decree for theft of state property. During and after the war, who crowded all the factories full, women and girls, and who had to feed the family? They. And what were they to feed the family with? Need knows no law. And so they would pilfer. They used to put sour cream in their pockets, sneak out rolls between their legs, wind stockings around their waists, and the likeliest way was to go to work barefoot and grab new stockings there at work, put them on and wash them at home and take them to the open market to sell. Whoever produced something would swipe that. They would stick a spool of thread between their breasts. All the watchmen had been bribed, for they had to live too, and they only picked off the few, hit or miss, and then the guard would jump in and there would be a body search, and it was ten years for that shitty spool, the same as for treason, and thousands got caught with those spools. Everyone was on the take to the extent that her work permitted it. Nastya Gurginka had it good. She used to work in the baggage cars, and she reasoned things out quite correctly. Our own Soviet people are persistent bastards, and they'll jump at your throat just for a lousy towel. Therefore, she never touched Soviet suitcases and cleaned out only foreigners. The foreigner, she said, wouldn't even think to check up on his things in time, and by the time he found out about it, he wouldn't bother to write a complaint, and all he would do was spit out... Russian thieves, and he would go back to his own country. Shitarev, an old bookkeeper, used to reproach Nastya. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're just a piece of meat. Why didn't you think about the honour of Russia? And she would tell him off. Up yours and stand still for it too. Why didn't you worry about victory? You used to let all those gentlemen officers go home to play stud dog. Shitarev had been a hospital bookkeeper during the war, and the officers used to grease his palms so that he would extend their period of sick leave by forging their travel documents, and they could go home before returning to the front. This was very serious. Shitarev had been sentenced to be shot, and only later was his sentence commuted to a tenor. Of course, there were all kinds of unfortunate serving time as well. One woman got a fiver for fraud. Her husband had died in the middle of the month, and she went on collecting his bread rations till the end of the month without turning the card in, using it for herself and for her two children. Her neighbours informed on her out of jealousy. She served four years too, and one year was knocked off by the amnesty. And this could happen too. 
A house was bombed out, the wife and children were killed, and the husband was left. All the ration cards were burned, but the husband was out of his mind and lived through the whole 13 days until the end of the month without bread rations and did not ask for a ration card for himself. Therefore, they suspected that all his ration cards were intact. They gave him three years, and he served one and a half of the three. Now, just a minute there, just a minute, Ivan Denisich. That's all for another time. And so you are telling us about a girl buddy, right? About sub marriage. She drags the same chain you do and doesn't complain.